you're leading off. All right. All right. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm really happy to see so many familiar faces in the room. As many of you know, I'm Bita Mustofi. I'm the commissioner for the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs. And I'm gonna start by telling you a little bit about my, my personal experience. My parents came to the United States from Iran in 1979. While they spoke a fair amount of English, there were still cultural barriers, challenges navigating bureaucratic systems, technical expressions, and more. This was before the internet, before social media, and really, frankly, before any news outlets existed in their language, native language of Farsi or Persian. I often found myself serving the role of interpreter, helping navigate challenging circumstances, forms we would receive from my school, writing my own excuse letters, which often helped me personally. <laughs> the truth comes out. <laughs> okay, we've uncovered a scandal here. <laughs> that early experience prepared me for what was to come when I later in life became an immigration lawyer, helping my clients navigate really difficult circumstances, understanding the services and resources that their children needed or they needed for themselves and how best to get that good information and trusted information to help them in their lives. As leaders in a city as incredibly and beautifully diverse as ours, we must constantly work to find ways to connect with everyone in every corner of the city, regardless of the language that they speak. You all are key to communicating important information, resources and updates, and learning issues that New Yorkers are facing. That's why we're implementing one of the most comprehensive language access laws in the country, because we know effectively our jobs can only be done if our residents have good information and can access city government. This is not just the right thing to do for immigrant New Yorkers, but it is good for all New Yorkers. Having joined this administration to help launch IDNYC in 2014, I learned early and often the importance of reaching New Yorkers through community and ethnic media press. You serve as a trusted and often critical source of information, sharing with our residents up-to-date information and reporting in ways that allow us to learn the needs of our communities. The city has relied on you to inform New Yorkers about key initiatives like IDNYC, like Pre-K for All, and like Thrive NYC. We've met to discuss the risks and potential responses to the Trump administration's public charge rule proposal. We've relied on our local Chinese press to warn New Yorkers about aggressive fraudulent scams that are targeting them. And we've re relied on Russian language press to help recruit interpreters to provide services at polling locations. This is how the sh city should work, listening and speaking directly to New Yorkers. Now, I'm incredibly proud to turn the floor over to somebody who, without whom none of this would be possible and who is an incredible champion of immigrants in our city, our Mayor Bill de Blasio. Thank you so much, Peter. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Uh, before we get into just a couple of updates and then we're looking forward to your questions, First, a profound thank you. I want to echo uh, Bita's point that uh, we depend deeply on you to get so much information out to our communities and to be voices of so many communities, geographical communities, ethnic communities, so many different parts of our city. And I think you do an extraordinary job uh, spreading the word, bringing the issues forward that need to be addressed by the city government, uh, sounding the alarm on the kinds of problems that uh, Bita just mentioned. Uh, we have had gatherings like this before. I always find them very important and helpful. And in fact, the announcement we're making today uh, literally emanates from one of our previous gatherings when so many of you said there was more that the city of New York could do uh, to support grassroots media, to support neighborhood-based and borough-based media, to support ethnic media, to support the folks who really are in constant dialogue with communities. Uh, at the most profound grassroots level. So we're going to talk about the things that we are doing now, hearing uh, the concerns you've raised, hearing the suggestions that you've raised, and acting on them. I want to just say up front a deep thank you to some of my colleagues. You're going to hear from a few, but want to also thank someone who's really focused on this and made a lot happen every day, our Director of Community and Ethnic Media, Jose Bayona. Thank you so much, Jose. I want to thank my Press Secretary, Freddie Goldstein, our Director of Operations, Jeff Tan Kirikasem, 
and our uh, dire- excuse me, our commissioner for uh, the our Department of Cons- I'm getting all my names wrong here, our Commissioner for Community Affairs and Acting Intergovernmental Director. He's got so many hats. Marco Carrion, thank you so much. Um, so I just wanted to say a quick personal note as well. My first uh, experiences with community media were as a resident in Brooklyn, finding that although you know the more mainstream media covered some of what was happening in Uh, my life, my family's life, our community's life, a whole lot was missing. And it was our community-based media that often brought the news forward that my family and I really needed and that my neighbors really needed. And I've seen this uh, first as a community resident, but then later as a community school board member and a city council member. And it was stark, you know, in a city of 8.6 million people that is also a city of neighborhoods, uh, we need media that understands our neighborhoods and speaks to them. And a lot of times, uh, the issues that were raised were entirely different than what you saw in the larger media. And uh, I think it's a, a crucial reality that we need to embrace and support in every way we can. So the fact is that New Yorkers look to you. And I've seen it time and time again. They look to you. They trust you. They look to you for uh, honest information. They look to you to understand what's really going on. There are many times where people understandably uh, are a little cynical about official pronouncements. And when they see information in your publications, uh, they have much more faith that they're getting the whole truth. Uh, This becomes particularly important in some of the challenges that we face every day, getting accurate information out to people. Uh, unquestionably, you all are going to play a crucial role uh, as we look ahead to the census. And this is one of these extraordinary moments where a lot is on the line, everyone knows. Billions and billions of dollars of federal funding, literally our level of representation in the Congress, this is what's up for grabs, and a very cynical approach by the Trump administration to try to discourage participation And where and how are they trying to discourage it? They're trying to discourage it in the larger cities of America. They're trying to discourage it among people of color and immigrants. It's a very cynical ploy. Uh, It's clear in the way the federal government is going about the census and the lack of uh, focus on honest outreach. But it's even more clear because of the inclusion of the immigration question. So we know what we're up against. And we are going to lean very heavily on all of you to help people understand how important the census is and to dispel the myths about the census. And again, your trusted voices will make a huge difference. Uh, If people understand through you what's on the line, I think they will act accordingly. And if folks don't get the message, I think a lot of people will stand back and not participate to the great detriment of all our communities. So... Knowing how important your work is and having heard from you that you need and deserve support, uh, I am signing an executive order today committing all city agencies to expend at least half of their annual print and digital ad budget on community and ethnic media starting in the upcoming fiscal year. So at least half will be the standard for all agencies from this point on. And if you don't mind, I think I'll sign it right now. Just you have evidence? There it is. (laughs) It's official. Yes, indeed. I always look to the left. <laughs> when in doubt, when in doubt, look to the left. I've always said that. <laughs> yes. Equal opportunity. You got it, everyone? Got it? Okay. And uh, we have looked around the country, and we think this is one of the most expansive, if not the most expansive, commitment by a local or state government uh, to ensuring that public advertising purchases will go to community and ethnic media. 
So I want to both brag on what my colleagues have put together here, but I also want you to spread the word to your colleagues around the country asking for similar actions to be taken. Uh, New York City is often the trendsetter. And here's a great example of something that other places can emulate as well. We're in a moment in history, I, I think I'm preaching to the choir here, but we're in a moment in history where media is under attack across the board. And that is particularly true uh, from Washington. We need to not only protect the media, but diversify the media in every sense. The more grassroots media, the better. The more community-focused media, the better. The more nonprofit media, the better. So here is an example of the city of New York using our power, our capacity to help ensure uh, the freedom and diversity of our media. Uh, the things that we will be advertising and promoting uh, affect the everyday lives in New Yorker, not just the census, but things like pre-K and 3K, where we want everyone to know about the opportunity for their children. Thrive, where we want to destigmatize the challenge of mental health and let people know that help is there for them in every community, in every language. Opportunities for minority and women-owned businesses that are growing all the time. But there's more businesses that could get certified to take advantage of them, and there's more and more contracts all the time that businesses can compete for. We want that information out there. The rights of tenants. In the last five years working with the city council, we've done so much to protect and expand the rights of tenants, especially the right to council law, ensuring that anyone threatened with a legal eviction can get a lawyer for free. That information has to get out there. And again, you're in a position to do that uh, better than anyone. So we will depend on you to keep spreading the word, to keep raising the issues. And thank you again for all you do. Uh, this action we're taking today is with great respect for the role you play in this city. And it's also another step towards making this the fairest big city in America where every voice is heard. With that, I want to turn to our still newly minted, newly minted commissioner for the Mayor's Office of Media and Entertainment, and she and her office play a crucial role in supporting uh, the media and media jobs in this city. So let's welcome her and congratulate her again, our new director, Ann Del Castillo. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor de Blasio. Uh, and good morning, everyone. Um, thank you, Mayor de Blasio, for your leadership on this very important issue, and to Commissioner Mustofi for your partnership in this effort. Um, I'm very pleased to be here with you today. As the agency that oversees economic development for the city's film, television, theater, music, advertising, publishing, and digital media industries, the Mayor's Office of Media and Entertainment recognizes the importance of community and ethnic media in our city's media landscape. In fact, New York City is the ethnic media capital with over 260 outlets reaching approximately 4.6 million people, so over half our population. In a city that sits at the center of a cultural, global cultural crossroads, New York City's community and ethnic media outlets fulfill a critical role in covering local and hyper-local news. They are uniquely situated to reach audiences who might otherwise be underserved due to language limitations or other barriers. Together, these outlets reach the broadest cross-section of our city's diverse communities and neighborhoods. Today's executive order is an important step in increasing support for their work your work. As part of this effort, our office will host the list of print and digital outlets on our website. Uh, following today's uh, signing, the list will be available at nyc.gov slash community media. Again, that's nyc.gov slash community media. We invite everyone here to check it out. The list will be updated on a regular basis. Outlets that aren't on it and want to be can contact the email address that will be provided on the website. While today's executive order is intended to bolster support from city agencies uh, to support community and ethnic media, we hope it will serve as a model for others uh, to follow suit and to support their local and digital print outlets. In this way, we can ensure the city's media landscape is as diverse as New York itself, and we can strengthen the city's position as a global media capital. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now I want to turn to our a DCAS Commissioner, Lizette Camillo, and she has led the way in ensuring uh, that city agencies uh, focus on connecting more deeply with our communities, and she understands it from her own experience how important that is. 
So my great pleasure to introduce Commissioner Lizette Camilla. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Mayor, and thank you so much to the partners uh, here at the table. I was smiling with your story, Bita, because that was very much my story, too, as the daughter of immigrants. Um, thank you all very much for all of the work that you do to help us get the word out to all of our communities of everything that's happening in New York City. Uh, my job is to make sure that government runs efficiently, but we wouldn't be able to do that without your help to getting out the information of all of our programs and, pro and uh, uh, work that we're doing uh, for all of our communities. Uh, that's why it's so important uh, that the city advertise our programs and services in all of your publications. Um, if you want evidence of the city's uh, commitment, don't take my word for it. Uh, the numbers really do speak for themselves. Uh, our advertising spending uh, with uh, your publication, your publications in 2018 was more than 220% greater than our spend was in 2013 before this administration started. City government spent over $2.7 million in FY18 alone in ad buys in all of your publications. Uh, that shows you our commitment to this effort. Um, and after today's uh, announcement, our, we expect that to grow uh, tremendously. Um, a few words in Spanish, if you'll sure. indulge. Gracias a todos ustedes por uh, su ayuda en comunicar las, las informaciones de los programas eh, de nuestra ciudad para todas nuestras comunidades. Nosotros no podemos hacer nuestro trabajo sin ustedes para asegurar que todos los residentes de esta ciudad sepan de los servicios que nosotros proveemos. Eh, eh, durante esta administración, nuestra, nuestro eh, compromiso en esta área ha crecido tremendamente. Desde antes de esta administración, eh, nosotros hemos comprado más, un, un aumento de, de compra de anuncios en sus publicaciones por más de 220%, un aumento de 220% eh, comparado a la previa administración. El año pasado solamente hemos comprado unos 2.7 millones de anuncios en sus publicaciones. Sin ustedes no podemos hacer nuestro trabajo efecti efectivamente. Eh, y después de este anuncio hoy, eh, ese compromiso solamente va a crecer. Gracias. Muchísimas gracias. De nada. <laughs> okay, so let's first, just any questions first on the executive order, this new initiative, and then we'll take questions on any other topics. Please. Hi, my name is Abu Tahir. I'm from Bangladesh Research Center of the Bangladeshi Community, and also I'm from Climate Education Research Center of the Bangladeshi. My question is how much money uh, you think since the executive order was signed, how much it will increase, and how long uh, the executive order will continue? The, the executive order will be permanent, obviously, throughout this administration. It will continue into the next administration unless a mayor alters it. And I'm sure you all will help the next mayor to see the light <laughs> and uh, stay focused on uh, community and ethnic media. As to how much money, is that Lizette or Jeff? Who wants to speak to it? I can do that. Just um, as uh, Commissioner Camillo uh, mentioned, We've had a 220% increase. Uh, community ethics media in 2013, roughly about $850,000. Uh, we're up closer to 2.7 million right now. We expect as we add kind of 50% um, as a threshold for every agency, we can increase uh, on that alone just about 900, almost a million dollars uh, in additional advice to the community ethic media outlets. Mike. Um, I thank you for recognizing community newspapers. Uh, we get to the neighborhoods where the dailies do not, and we carry that message. The U.S. Census, I was on a committee, and the U.S. Census is committing $500 million to advertising. And when we asked them at the Jewish Relations Council meeting, what languages, and they missed Yiddish, and that's a language for many people in the parts of Brooklyn. And they say, well, you do it yourselves. So the community papers are going to have to do it. But the mechanics of what you're announcing today, every city agency has a media budget. Either it goes through another private agency. Are you saying that there will be somebody within the administration that will be designating the papers and the budgets that will go out? So for the sanitation department, the Department of Health, or all public messages that is general in nature, not just here to the ethnic media market, because of language. Are we talking about all agencies will now be, you know, directed to have a higher level of understanding of what the budget will go to for community papers? And I'll start and my colleagues will jump in. So every agency is being instructed 
Act who have the minimum of 50% for community and ethnic media in terms of their advertising budget. Uh, standards are being set centrally to uh, train all agencies in common approach, bless you, and then each agency has to make a decision based on what they need. For example, if they're particularly trying to reach parents, if they're particularly trying to reach seniors, if they're particularly trying to reach a community where there's a particular challenge, some of the examples uh, that Bita raised. If there's a scam in one community we want to stop, if we need to recruit translators from another community, it will all vary according to each agency's need. But everyone's going to be trained in common standards of how to maximize advertising in ethnic and community media. Who wants to speak to any more of the details? Yeah, I'll jump in. That's exactly right. And I think, you know, what we wanted to ensure was that as agencies are looking at their ad buys and they're thinking about how best to communicate to New Yorkers, they have a level of flexibility, but that at the end of the year, the commitment in ensuring that they're looking at communicating broadly through your outlets, that's where the 50% comes in and where there will be an accountability measure that's centralized um, through Jeff's office, through the mayor's office of operations. And we'll be joining together to, as the mayor said, do training with um, with our agencies. As many of you know, we have already published a community and ethnic media directory that will remain up to date for people to utilize um, in their thinking and their decision making. And also we will work to make sure that they're effectively aware of what outlets exist depending on the kinds of initiatives that they're undertaking. Okay, other questions? Yes. I don't know, my name is Javier Castaño from Queens Latino. I don't know exactly how the executive order functions, but is there a way, or is fair to say that it's a way to keep this trend after you leave office? <laughs> or the other somebody can uh, again, I, I think you all are, have powerful voices and represent large communities, and we've set a standard now, and I would strongly suggest that it would be very hard from a future, for a future administration to back away from it, so, so long as you keep it front and center that this is something important to all the communities that you represent. So I, I think this will end up being a permanent feature. Uh, and we're going to show how effective it is. All of us together are going to show how effective it is in reaching people, including a lot of people who were not being reached previously. Yes. Hi, I'm Dina Ratner with Brooklyner. Um, in the past, um, New York City agencies, while you've advertised with different outlets, there's been um, more of a concentration of advertising in print. In with this new executive order, will there be um, more of an effort to um, take into consideration advertising in digital publications, uh, because in the past it's been yeah. larger money. No, fair point. And digital is included here. Anyone wants to speak to the details? But digital is absolutely included. Mm -hmm. Yeah, digital is included, and precisely because I think, as everybody knows, to effectively communicate, that's often the, the primary or first place that people go. The data shows us that when we look at, when we speak to community groups or conduct surveys, so that is a part of this. And in a, as a part of the training, we will kind of talk about and touch on the usefulness of doing that work. Hey, Deborah Lee. Thank you for uh, gathering us together. Um, to your point, what uh, measures will be instituted um, in alignment with this to account for accountability? How can, at the end of the next fiscal cycle, can we say, <clears throat> in fact, this was this was actually done? And my second question is, to what degree, and I think we've talked about this, um, certainly, I think, amongst all of ourselves, um, this is important. Uh, it's undeniably important. The reason that we're all here is because we are all scrappy as hell. Mm -hmm. We've all managed to make this, you know, make it this far. This will help. But to what degree does this administration feel that it's also compelled to do the same things that it does with the other newspapers in terms of breaking stories, of allowing for information to be first released in these outlets, to be given those first uh, opportunities, the first cracks at having those, uh, you know, announcements about Thrive NYC, the expansion thereof, etc., or for that matter, a new commission. When will those opportunities also roll this way? Look, I, I think that's the def definition of a case-by-case -case situation. Uh, clearly, there are some situations where I think that would make a lot of sense, and there's others where it might not, but it's something we should focus on more. Uh, it's a fair concern. I like the scrappiness point. Uh, you know, having come up the scrappy way myself, I honor and respect it. I think, so it's a fair, uh, a fair demand to put on the table to say to us, 
where there's situations where we can break some important news through some of the outlets here. And I will turn to people like uh, Freddie and Jose and say, there's your new assignment to figure out how we can do that more often. Because the good news is we have a whole lot of news, uh, not just coming out of City Hall, but coming out of all our agencies. And I think, in fact, sometimes we have not uh, amplified some of the things we're doing well enough, and I know all of you would in a, in a good and objective way. So I think that's a very fair suggestion. We should do that more often. I'm sorry, the first part of your question was on accountability. So look, we obviously are doing this because we want it to happen. We want it to work, and each agency will be held accountable by us. But in terms of a more uh, public accounting, so you can have a confirmation that it happened, Jeff, or yeah, you want to speak to that? Speak to it. Uh, there are probably four things. One, obviously, is we're uh, working with Vita uh, and, uh, and Moya to kind of do trainings. Uh, we'll also start to gather and check in with agencies quarterly on where their spends are based on their targets. And ultimately, we'll be kind of working with them to get there. But also, by the end of FY20, we'll also have a um, public accounting and putting the information related to spends on open data. So there'll be a public uh, website, basically, where you can access that data set. Can I ask one question to this part of my yeah. digital means just online or uh, ethnic TV, television as well? It is online, not online. television and radio. Television as well, or just online? Online. Online. Not television. All right, let's get voice of authority. Say it again so everyone understands. Online. <laughs> OK. <laughs> yes. Hi, um, Pat Stevenson, Howard Community News. I've spoken to people at most of your agencies. We've been working um, um, at this for a while. Um, their term, when I asked them about advertising in the Harlem News, and we do publish in Brooklyn, Queens, and Bronx, and specifically reach the African American community, the term they use is we need to go in citywide publications. So when you have that conversation, I'm telling you that's what they give me. Yeah, that's not good because that. Citywide publication. Yeah, that's not the whole story, and they shouldn't say it that way. Which agents? No, you need to. You can do it privately, but you actually need to. <laughs> one that I was at a meeting last week and they boasted about the fact that they are um, advertising MWBE opportunities in the post and out there. And they said it with pride. And I'm sitting there saying, what? These are MWBE opportunities and you're, you think the post is like... I'm so tempted to comment. But I'm, I'm going to keep it really high level here. Uh, I'm just saying that, you know, that there needs to be an education. Yes. Because there is this belief, you know, and so. You know, no, I, look, thank you. Um, so one, we actually need that feedback. And if you would talk to one of my colleagues or Freddie or Jose afterwards, we need that feedback. Because, look, I think, I think a lot of you have observed closely as we made a lot of changes with our agencies. Uh, and the MWB effort is a good example. It has taken real effort to get agencies to fully understand what time it is uh, and make the changes that we have demanded in terms of MWB spending. And it is working, but it takes real effort to break out of certain habits that existed over, let's say, 20 years. And uh, this is a good example, too. We are explicitly saying community, and ethnic media. Community media includes neighborhood-based publications, borough-based publications. It inherently means not just citywide publications. So uh, we want to make sure that we get the word out through lots of different platforms. Uh, if anyone is being told they can't participate, we need to hear that back to make sure we're correcting that. And the whole idea of training the agencies in common and giving them a really clear standard. What I love about 50% is it's a really hard standard to miss. You know, it's clear as a bell what we're looking for here, and we're going to hold each of them accountable. So I'm glad you raised it, and will you please follow up, because we do need to know who did that. Ellie. Hey. Amsterdam News. Uh, well, first of all, thank you for signing this executive order. It's something we've been fighting for for years. So in 2006, there were some city council hearings on the advertising agencies in general, and uh, the advertising agencies themselves did not show up mm. to these city council hearings. Mm. Uh, and that's where my question lies. Um, a lot of the city agencies rely on the advertising and media placement agencies to do the media placements. Mm. 
how are they going to be held accountable and how are they going to be trained because a lot of times it's the agencies that don't know about the community and ethnic media that you want the agencies to be placing with. It's a circle. A very fair point. Colleagues? I can start. So we have begun some of those conversations. As you heard, This there's been an increase over the last several years that has not been through no work on our part. Um, we've met with the agencies themselves. We've actually shared the directory that we developed, and, and may, many thanks to CUNY for the support um, in doing that work, um, and talked about the importance for us in having robust information shared with the agencies, and that that is a part of their responsibility if they are to continue getting contracts from the city in doing this work. Um, additionally, we've not stopped in thinking about how best to make sure that agencies have good examples. So one of the things that we've done is we've set up a portal that allows agencies to access best practices in doing some of this work. So example of, of ad buys that they can look at that look robust that include many of your outlets and so forth to, to get informed and be informed themselves. They already have access to the directory themselves. They'll have access to best practices and samples from other agencies and we'll continue to work and uh, make sure that the agencies themselves are doing the work that they ought to, but want to hear from you if the experiences that you have are negative or contrary or inconsistent with what our goals are. And I think looking at the diversity on, that agency, on those agency sides yep. is yeah, we look, we would really like help on this. Um, we are trying, and we've been doing this over the last five years, to ensure that our agencies not only are reaching out to all communities with all different approaches and platforms, we're trying to ensure that the leadership and the staff agencies looks like New York City. We're trying to ensure the agencies are maximizing MWBE purchasing. There's a lot going on simultaneously. We have all sorts of metrics, all sorts of ways to monitor that, but the feedback directly from folks who care about communities or focused on communities or listening to communities helps us immensely, right down to whether certain agencies are being as responsive as they need to be or not. And you make a great point about the ad placement agencies, but I'm, I'm talking about uh, them, but most especially our own city government agencies. So. Um, I want, please, everyone, before you leave today, make sure, I assume you have relationships with a lot of the folks up here. If you don't, get to know them now, exchange information. We need that feedback loop because we urgently want to lock in these changes. Uh, I look at it as we have two and a half years to really make this the way things will be in New York City for the future, to the previous question about the executive order and all. We want to change the assumptions in this government and then keep it that way. But that is going to take you know, real careful work. If some agencies are less responsive, we need to know that. So I am welcoming <laughs> as intense a feedback loop as possible. And then I'll hold my good colleagues here accountable that if they find one of our city agencies is not being quick enough to act on this mandate, or is not listening to concerns being raised that all of you uh, need to aggressively intervene. And particularly uh, Jeff, whose role as Director of Operations involves him with every agency, uh, making sure that their managerial efforts are effective. You are particularly well placed to be, I would never say an enforcer, that's such a strong word, <laughs> a conscience, a conscience to help them do well. Who else? Yes, sir. First of all, thank you for making this announcement today. My publisher is really excited about it. <laughs> all right. <laughs> um, I, I want to mention uh, th there are two parts to advertising and ethnic media. Number one is the advertising dollars, which is obviously probably most welcome. Number two is the message itself. Um, uh, particularly in Yiddish, I'm familiar with, you know, I don't know what the other people over here say who have, you know, newspapers in their own languages, but the, English, the, 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 the grammar is atrocious, if you don't mind me, you know, being blunt. You're saying when we, when we translate, you're saying? When we, into Yiddish, when, it's, when we have a message in Yiddish, it looks like the city is using a 20-year-old version of Google Translate. <laughs> um, it, it's how I many regular Yiddish speakers can't even recognize a lot of the words. Um, if you just Google this, you know, it, it's online, or a lot of complaints about this. I was wondering what could be done that the, that the message itself should be readable to readers as if they're reading 
their, 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 their mother tongue. They're not really some, you know, yeah, look, I want to say we got uh, appreciate the question a lot. And, and in a moment of uh, reflection here, we got a good education during a tough situation recently with this measles crisis, which, thank God, seems to now be leveling off, that uh, a lot of our approach was dated, you know, was not as modern, agile, quick as it could be, and that we had to think about both Yiddish and English from day one. I want to give a lot of credit to the folks at the health department and at City Hall for recognizing that there was a missing link and acting on it quickly. Uh, and special credit to Penny Ringle, who's now my uh, social media director. <laughs> the, uh, the, but uh, we need to do better uh, being creative and effective with our communication, but especially ensuring that we're translating the exact moment we need to translate and translating well and effectively. Often easier said than done when you're talking about so many languages simultaneously in one city. But that has to be our goal. So to my colleagues, uh, and I think several of you have perspective on this, uh, what can we do and who can we enlist to ensure that our translations are better? Yeah, thank you for that um, really important point. And I think, it, you know, being honest, it is a struggle of ours. Um, we have uh, begun in this past year really implementing, as I said in my remarks, one of the most robust language access policies in the country. It's included increased trainings, the appointment of language access coordinators at every agency, a language access plan for every agency, a requirement that they all have contracts in place that allow for, for translation and interpretation services. Um, but one of the things that we've had to focus on is education around um, really making sure that your materials are in plain language and that you're giving enough lead time to do extra review of, of the translations because we know how often they're not great. So that's part of the education that we're doing. It's part of the trainings that we've been doing with staff. It's very helpful for us to get this feedback, to understand where our services are not where they need to be. Uh, we've been testing also third um, uh, third, third party review processes because we often know the second often doesn't catch the idiosyncratic and technical language. So really appreciate feedback that you all have in your particular languages that you're seeing play out so that we can do the work that we need to do and make sure that we're effectively uh, doing the translation right off the bat and that the information is effective and, and readable and comprehensible by everybody. Okay, let me take a Yes. Yes, well said. Who has not gone yet? Yes. Uh, how will you ensure that the uh, city agencies don't pull ads from local media and ethnic media that give the bad press or uh, that it's not used as a plum? We, uh, I think it's safe to say that uh, we're pretty impervious at this point to the notion of <laughs> critical stories in the media. Uh, the, no, I, I expect every media outlet uh, to have critical stories and to uh, point out things we need to do better. I would like to also believe every media outlet, when they think we've done something right, will also report that with equal fervor. But no, that's, it would never be acceptable to make decisions based on that. It has to be based on how do we reach the many, many people in the city who need the information. And honestly, uh, I mean, my colleagues can jump in any way you want. I've never heard anyone suggest that in terms of our uh, ad buying practices, and I wouldn't tolerate it if I ever saw it. Yes. Uh, Mr. My name is Jahangir Pataka, and I'm with the uh, Center for Community and Ethnic Media at the uh, Prima Graduate School of Journalism. Uh, this uh, point of distribution of ads, uh, ad buys came up. And we did a speed dating with a few city agencies with the help of Jose Biona. Uh, and uh, what we found, it was very helpful, very, very helpful. We uh, got great feedback from our colleagues from the community and ethnic media. But one point that, was, that also came out of it was uh, that some of the agencies, like when I am representing a newspaper, I go and meet with agency A and ask them that, hey, I am in existence, I don't get an ad. What should I be doing? So some of the people got the answer that, look, we are here, we'll give you all the information, but we don't have any control. 
it's the uh, you know advertising agency which decides and then uh, when i heard from some advertising agency like miller they said we don't have any control we get the information from the city agency yeah. so there seems to be some disconnect somewhere yeah. which, which really uh, causes many people being left out yeah so i'm just trying to raise this point that how would you ensure that all these very very legit publications which are in the city and in great numbers and they are simply left out so i'll start and then my colleagues can jump in look one, the whole purpose of this announcement by increasing, you know, it's a bigger slice of the pie that helps more people be included. And by making it a priority, by signing a mayoral executive order, by saying we value this and we need this, and then training all the agencies, I think we are changing the entire attitude and approach. Uh, I am very concerned about this point about the... Um, the actual placement agencies and making sure that they are consistent with this. It's an excellent point. We need to make sure that happens. But because we are asking, you know, dozens and dozens of agencies to align to this need, it is these folks here who have to be in the position to uh, ensure that it happens and it happens consistently. Everyone, and I again note Jeff's particular role, because his job is to look at the management and accountability structures in every agency to begin with, and uh, he's very well placed uh, to ensure things happen. But we need that feedback loop if people see anything they think is not consistent. That is a different question. I want to be real with people. As Do we have the ideal amount of money to ensure that everyone gets as much as they want all the time? Absolutely not. I mean, let's just be real about that from the beginning. There is a limit on how much we're, we are able to spend on advertising to begin with because of all the other uh, demands. Uh, and there's a lot of outlets out there. So, you know, I am certainly not suggesting this will be, bring perfection, but I think it'll bring real tangible progress. But the best way to ensure the progress is real is a feedback loop from all of you. Does anyone else want to add? Go ahead, Jeff. I can just add one thing. I think that um, one of the main focuses has been on this training, standardizing it across all the agencies, but also working with both the advertisers and agencies to kind of align. I think we'll also take it as an opportunity as a feedback loop within the trainings themselves. So as we get the trainings out, uh, we're not going to just have a one-time training. These are going to be uh, repeated iterative trainings, and we'll use that as a loop, feedback loop to gain uh, more issues that we should highlight in later trainings. Anyone else who has not gone, let me just give anyone a chance who hasn't gone. Uh, how do we as newspapers plug into this, provide our data, what we can do, how do we register, you know? Who's got it? Yeah. I'll start and then yeah. Anna. So um, Anna could speak to the list that's on the MOM website and it's important to go on there and make sure you um, are listed and that your information is accurate and then any additional information that you want to provide for us would be helpful um, and can help inform what we internally have for agencies to access um, that is slightly more expansive than that. I just wanted to say that the list is actually live on the site now. I just got confirmation of that. <laughs> it's working. Um, so <laughs> you, we, we definitely want the folks in this room and your colleagues to go and check and make sure that you're on the list. And if you're not, there, there is a contact on there that you can email and send and just make submit the request to get added to that list. And will, will you just reach out to people on this list, or is there something that we have to do to, you know, like for like? Uh, you mean in terms of? Uh, the agencies just say, oh, okay, here's a list. They just do that. Yes. Go ahead. I'm uh, working with Pakistani newspaper, a TV channel, the name of the Day International. Uh, my question is not regarding this. Uh, uh, sure, we can segue to other questions. Go ahead. Uh, we know that you are a uh, pro immigrant. Uh, yeah, I'm what? You know that we know that you are pro immigrants. Yes. And uh, while the incumbent president is extremely uh, anti-immigrants and immigration. So uh, my question is that uh, if you be become the president of this country, so what will be your policies uh, regarding immigration and immigrants for this country? So look, a very quick, important answer. I mean, I be this begins personally for me. Um, my grandparents came from a small town in southern Italy. They did not speak English when they got here. Uh, my mother's first language was not English. Uh, they uh, struggled. 
They did not have a lot of resources. They did have family here that helped them to get established. Um, but they didn't come here with, you know, uh, particular skills. They came here because they were ready to work hard and to do something for their family they could never do, you know, in a, a very po impoverished, limited world they came from. And, uh, you know, the beauty of this country is that they came here. Uh, my grandparents, of course, did not have a college education. All three of their daughters got a college education, and now I'm the mayor of New York City. I, mean, I think that just epitomizes everything that is good about uh, the immigrant experience. Uh, we should allow at every subsequent generation to have the same opportunity to contribute and to be a part of this. So I think it begins with just changing this narrative and making very clear that immigration is, uh, has always been a part of what works about, New York, about uh, America, about New York City, and is going to be in our future. I believe in uh, comprehensive immigration reform. I believe in a path to citizenship for the folks who are here. I believe that we can rationalize the way that people come here to work, because there's so many parts of this country that are hurting right now. There's not enough people willing and able to do work that is needed. And meanwhile, all these artificial barriers have been created to folks coming in to work when everyone involved needs their help and their contribution, and they would benefit and their families would benefit. So uh, I actually think these changes are coming. I think this is a bit of the storm before the calm, if I could turn the phrase on its head. I think the American people increasingly believe in comprehensive immigration reform. They absolutely believe the dreamers should stay. Uh, they're appalled uh, by the actions being taken at the border in terms of family separation. I think there's an emerging American majority in favor of a sane and rational and respectful immigration policy. And as president, that's what I would institute. Where's my gone? Yes. So, Mayor Pete came to Brooklyn. Elizabeth Warren is in Brooklyn today. Are you coming to Brooklyn to campaign? I think I'll be in Brooklyn. <laughs> I will definitely, look, we have a long way until the New York primary, but I think it's safe to say that people in my homeland of Brooklyn know me very, very well. I think that's a bit of an advantage. Uh, so as we get closer to the New York primary, unquestionably, I will be campaigning in Brooklyn and all of New York. Uh, but you will not be surprised to know that my first focus will be on the first state's voting. Yes. Uh, yes, Mr. Mayor. Uh, First of all, congratulations on jumping the presidential Thank race. You, Steve. I, I've always supported that, even though we don't always see eye to eye. Um, President Trump is is uh, threatening, or he has started to fly immigrants from the border around to states. And one thing he's he's trying to do is send immigrants to sanctuary cities and sanctuary states. Are you prepared to take in thousands of immigrants from the border? And if so. How are you prepared to pay for that? I've spoken to this before. If it is a political act by the president, it's illegal. And we will challenge him in court, and we will beat him as we have before. You know, when that first came to light that there was a political motivation uh, for trying to— He's, he's sent some people to Florida now. But let me, let me finish the point. When it first came to light that there was a political motivation for how to move people around— even people at the Department of Homeland Security said, and it's public now, that they believe that was illegal. It is illegal. It's abundantly clear it's illegal. So I would challenge that legally. Uh, that's very different than if it's something being done on the basis of uh, a policy that treats every uh, city, every state equally and fairly. That's a different discussion. But we don't know exactly what their policy is. You'll remember during family separation, the federal government did nothing to communicate with New York and other places that were receiving the children who had been separated from their parents. So the first thing we need to understand is what are they doing? Uh, why are they doing it? Is it politically motivated or is it motivated by some better reason? And what are they doing to ensure that families and children are being treated properly? These are all questions that we don't have answers to. Can I add to that? Please, yes. So I would just note that what you're seeing play out with Florida is different than the threat that the president has, has made quote unquote threat around sending kids to sanctuary city or other families. They're sending people to locations that have essentially border ports of entry, right? So where they can process folks because they're overwhelmed along the border as you know. New York City doesn't have the equivalent of the locations that exist in Florida and other places. Um, and we, we know that that's not 
happening here yet. So um, I think important to sort of draw the distinction and at what the mayor said is accurate is we don't we don't actually know what a policy would look like that would bring people here. Just real quick, as a presidential candidate, there is a crisis on the border. How do you? How would you, as president, alleviate that crisis? Look, it begins with respecting the historic right to asylum, uh, which is something that goes back to the founding of this nation, uh, and respecting asylum seekers. Look, not everyone who comes claiming asylum qualifies, but many do. And it begins with respecting their rights. It's, if you look at our history, uh, uh, you know, throughout all of the different eras of American history, there's been an understanding that people have come here fleeing oppression, and it's in the DNA of this country. Um, so one is to create a rational process and to resource it properly so we can actually uh, make those decisions in real time effectively. Two is to try and address some of the root causes that are leading to these challenges. So when you look at the many, many things that the United States doesn't have on the federal level, and, and they all kind of connect, we don't have a policy to address global warming as a nation. Our city does but the United States of America doesn't. We don't have a coherent policy to address immigration and, and migration dynamics generally. Uh, we don't have a coherent policy to support our neighbor countries in addressing the underlying challenges they face, uh, whether it's uh, the violence and, and challenges in Mexico or even more sharply what we're seeing in places like Honduras and Guatemala. So um, the the best way to address the bigger challenge is to try to help those nations to address what's happening in their nations that are causing so many people to look to here for a better life. And I think there's a lot that we can do that would make a real impact. But right now, it, there's an incoherent federal approach uh, that tries to look the other way and is militarizing the border. It's also exactly the wrong thing to do to use our military at the border. It's a misuse of military resources. It's very costly to the taxpayer. Uh, so I think there's a host of changes that are needed. Yes. Yeah, thank you for taking my question. My name is Victoria, and I'm with uh, U.S. African Immigrants. Just uh, first, I wanted to thank you. Uh, you've engaged my community uh, quite uh, a while, so I really appreciate that. I wanted to comment on IDNYC. Um, at the point, at the time that it was initiated, we were very concerned. Uh, a lot because we thought, you know, when President Trump came, people were going to be rather under and taken away. So, thank you for protecting that. People are sort of like, you know, <coughs> feeling a little secure with that. Uh, uh, and my question on that is: is it is it possible at some point that folks that are on that list and have been doing well, would they be able to get their driver's license at some point, um, you know, in the future while you're still a mayor? or if you happen to you know, make it down there to White House, is this going to be a part of a you know, question or talk, conversation that you will open up? Question Can I stay on the first one first? Yeah, so I do believe that uh, driver's licenses should be provided to anyone who qualifies, uh, despite, uh, regardless of uh, immigration status. Um, I hope the state of New York will pass that law in this session. The only way that can happen in New York is with state law. It cannot happen locally. Um, I was in Nevada a few weeks ago, and it's the law there. And it's a recognition there that that's about safety and fairness. And I want to emphasize that. The, for everybody, ensuring that folks on the road have gone through a licensing process uh, and that everyone is accounted for and if you know they need to wear eyeglasses when they drive or whatever other stipulations are there It's it's the right thing for everyone's safety. It's also a matter of fairness to hard-working people who are part of our community So I support it here. I support it everywhere But uh, that can only happen with state action. What's your second question? Yeah, my second question is uh, back to the executive order that was signed today uh, I know that this is government and with government comes bureaucracy hmm. What? Precisely, do we or do I need to do to like get into that? Like, so, rather than restate what I, the my colleagues here will go over all the details after I leave. Just so I think that'd be helpful when we finish my section. Just take the very practical and technical questions. They'll help you figure out exactly what you have to do. Supporters um, of Eric Garner say that um, you. They blame you for uh, the disciplinary trial of Daniel Pantaleo for um, taking as long as it did to start 
and say that you not firing him earlier shows that you know you're not presidential material and don't stand with communities of color. Um, what, what, what is your response to their concerns? And if the judge who is overseeing the disciplinary trial uh, recommends the police commissioner fire him or rules against him, would you? Would you fire? Again, we're not going to prejudge a trial and due process. So I've been asked this a lot of times, and you can ask as many times as you want, but I'm going to keep saying the same thing because it's the truth. First of all, I know the Garner family, and I, I feel for them everything they've been through. My heart goes out to them. It's been an extraordinarily painful uh, loss and everything that's happened since. But, you know, I need people to be real about this. <laughs> Uh, we had the Federal Justice Department tell us not to proceed because they were dealing with much higher level charges than could ever be brought through departmental charges. Departmental charges are just about employment. The Federal Justice Department was looking at much uh, different, greater charges. Uh, I need people to be honest with the community and with the family about this fact rather than just uh, stoking controversy for the sake of it. Uh, the Justice Department under two administrations did not make a decision. That is the truth. That is the fact. It is obvious. Uh, we would have proceeded with departmental charges immediately had we not been told by the Justice Department not to. When they finally said they were at a point where they were not asking us to hold back, we proceeded. And there will be a resolution this year. I'm not going to prejudge the resolution because I do believe in due process. There will be a resolution this year, once and for all, via the city of New York and the police department of New York. But you should be asking the same question of the Justice Department still. They still have not made a decision on whether they're proceeding and what they're doing. And I think that demand needs to be placed at their table where it belongs. Have you seen the Staten Island numbers yet? That's a really different topic. I'll come back to you. Who has not gone? Um, yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, for having us here. Um, I have two questions, one concerning you as a mayor, and the other one is your presidential... Um, so do one at a time, because I'd like to give a clear answer to each one. So the first question is that uh, there are groups of activists in the Bronx, you know, who are um, asking you if you would consider um, turning Rackett Island into an international multi-billion dollar museum so that um, you know, what is known today as all things bad in the Bronx will at least be transformed into a very positive traffic you know, from all over the world coming to the Bronx you know, to visit you know, one of a kind International Peace Museum. Would you consider that? Look, we are going to, we're going to close Rikers Island where we've just announced we're going to close it a year uh, quicker than originally planned. Um, and I want to thank everyone who fought in Albany uh, for the reforms we needed, the criminal justice reforms that are finally opening the door to getting off Rikers even quicker. And we're going to build the community-based jails, and we're going to turn the page as a city and, and help a lot of people to be rehabilitated and help a lot of people to never see the inside of a jail to begin with. What happens next with Rikers is going to be a, a real a community process and a citywide discussion. Uh, now, obviously, that's some years away, but there's a lot of different options that could open a lot of doors for the city uh, in terms of the things that we need everywhere. And I'm particularly interested in what we might be able to do with affordable housing, not necessarily there, but by opening up other spaces around the city and putting facilities on Rikers. Uh, meaning, you know, different types of agencies, not corrections, obviously. But if that idea is on the table for people and they want to propose it, that will be considered too, because no decisions have been made. That will be a full public process. What's your other question? Yeah, the other question is, uh, there is a, a group in California that has done a marvelous job in recruiting um, Congress, you know, folks in D.C. to really consider a Department of Peace, cabinet level Department of Peace, because we spent $700 billion for Pentagon budget. Now you have all the problems uh, you know, with different countries, so these countries can no longer live there, so they have to come here, do all kinds of crazy things. So if you have cabinet level Department of Peace that can handle most of the mundane, then we will not have to spend $700 billion 
in death and destruction. So I think, uh, you know, as you know, you are pursuing, you know, the White House. I think, uh, considering the cabinet level Department of Peace. Yeah, I think it makes sense. I don't know if this... I had not heard that idea before to the best of my memory, but um, it's an interesting idea. I would say another way to think of it, though, is that the Department of State uh, should, in all it does, be focused on fostering peace. Um, and clearly, we have a long way to go. Our, our history suggests there were many opportunities where we could have fostered peace and we didn't. And we now can, I think. Uh, one of the things I talk about a lot is the War Powers Act and the fact that uh, after Vietnam, and I, I remember the Vietnam War uh, intensely and personally from the perspective of being a young person in a family that had a, a draft age uh, child in it, my oldest brother. Um, you know, after Vietnam, the Congress passed the War Powers Act and then proceeded never to use it which is a huge mistake. Only recently on uh, Yemen was, has you seen the Congress finally use its own power. And I think everyone involved uh, did not step up to the plate, did not take the actions they needed to, to make decisions on war and peace the way our founders intended through the Congress. That's different than immediate military actions when there's a, a very urgent and specific threat. But on bigger decisions of war and peace, there's supposed to be a congressional debate and a congressional decision. I think putting that back into the way this country functions, and I think the vast majority of the American people would agree with that, uh, is another one of the most important ways to foster peace rather than have it be so easy to go to war. And the Iraq war is the, the horrible poster child for this. That uh, that was a situation that, that should never have happened the way it did. And we need uh, a much more intensive and careful process before we go to war. Go ahead. community boards have uh, uh, not approved the plan, two land use committees overwhelmingly have rejected the plan. What, and some people who have been supporters are starting to get cold feet and backing away from their support. What additional concessions are you willing to make when it comes to size and scope? Of I just disagree with your assessment. Uh, the the process, although we listen to a whole range of community voices, and I've been at the community advisory board meetings in three of the four boroughs and we're listening and we're working on people's concerns in the end the land use process revolves around the city planning commission and the city council and the city council members involved have been adamant that they believe it's the right thing to do speaker johnson has been adamant to his great credit i've been adamant uh, so this is moving forward we will continue to make uh, adjustments and, and address community concerns. We'll continue to determine what are helpful community benefits. As we've said, we're going to make those facilities as small as we can, given uh, a changing environment. We've now said we think 4,000 is the level of uh, jail population we'll have in the future. I want to remind everyone, our jail population is down 30 percent since I took office, and that was very systematic, creating a lot more uh, alternatives to incarceration. Uh, just arresting a lot fewer people. And I mentioned earlier the concept of good news, which I know doesn't travel as far as bad news, but I want everyone please to report this fact. In 2018 in New York City, there were 150,000 fewer arrests than in 2013. 150,000 fewer arrests and we got safer. Uh, it's also a way to drive down mass incarceration. So we're gonna get to that 4,000 level and therefore, we can make those jails smaller. Uh, but we are adamant that, that this is the right policy we're carrying through with it. So you, would you be willing to make the jails smaller than the 5,700? Again, what I've said very publicly is based on the new number, we're looking at what is the right size. We want the jails to be as small as they can be. We have not published the exact size of each one because we're still doing that analysis. Did you? OK, go ahead. Yes, from Mayor, you know that you, you have a lot of uh, support from immigrants in your uh, presidential campaign, but basically one of the most concerned, the biggest concern from Latino people is the immigration reform. Would you be willing to promote any immigration reform, the legalization for people with not documents in your first 100 days as a president? Look, this is one of the most important issues facing this country that we have comprehensive immigration reform. I absolutely believe in it. It would absolutely be a priority. Uh, we need to end this division that's plaguing our country. 
uh, and the American people are ready for it. So, as you know, something like that would require the Congress. But as president, I would make it a high priority to say, let's have the comprehensive immigration reform we need. Let's recognize the 12 million people who are here already and are part of our community. And let's move forward as a country in unity rather than having this artificial division. The important point to remember is there's a lot of frustration in this country over inequality, over the fact that people feel economically that they and their families are going backwards. The immigrants didn't do that to them. The 1% did that to them. And I'm going to be very blunt about that on the campaign trail. Immigrants have been demonized, and folks who are dealing with real economic frustration, working class and middle class people all over this country, are being told, particularly by the Republican Party, to think that immigrants did it to them. The immigrants didn't do it to them. The wealthy and the corporations did it to them. And that's the conversation we need to have in this country. Even though President Trump has been done a lot of bad things, is there any credit that you can give him as a president? Like something that you think this is something good that he has done and I have to admit it? Yeah, and I don't have any problem saying that. I, I can tell you it's very few examples. And I can tell you that the, the pain and division he has caused uh, goes against everything that we ever should see in a president. But, for example, I actually think he has been focused on the opioid crisis. And he's taken at least some actions that are helpful on that front, and that's important. But, uh, again, I wish I could, uh, despite differences, I wish I could point to a number of things that have been good for this country. There have been very few. Last one is someone who has not gotten a chance. Who has not gotten a chance? How do you include the ethnic media in your campaign when you are campaigning for president? And then President Trump said two days ago, you are the worst mayor. <laughs> what is it here? So... Uh, on the <laughs> first, I absolutely intend uh, to be accessible and involved with ethnic and community media wherever I go. I believe in it. And again, I would say I have this I'm going to hold up as I say these words. <laughs> Actions speak louder than words. So I believe in community and ethnic media, and I want to engage it wherever I go. Uh, to the president's comments the other day. Look, I truly believe that the issues I'm raising and the approach I take uh, is penetrating and causing him to have to respond. And I think that's what we need. And I'll say this as a candidate. This is what we need to uncover his lies and beat him. And uh, I have no hesitation uh, to take him on very aggressively. I gave him a new nickname, Con Don, because he is a con man. Every New Yorker has seen it for decades. How many, you know, how many workers did he stiff? You know, how many times has he lied about his income? How many times has he uh, avoided paying taxes? He's a con man. And so I'm going to call him out. And it's obviously having an effect. Because not only did he attack me with that uh, that characterization, which I think confirms to many people in America, I must be a great mayor if he's calling me the, great, the worst mayor in America. That means I must be doing something right. Uh, but also, if you look at the video he filmed on Air Force One, which, by the way, was illegal because it shows the presidential seal, and it's clearly a political uh, video, and that's illegal under U.S. law. But something I'm saying is getting to him and unnerving him, and that's meaning, that means it's working. So I'm going to be very aggressive. But I think when people look at what's happened here in New York City, um, hey, I, I look forward to putting my credentials before the American people. We are the safest big city in America. Uh, we have the most jobs we've ever had. We have the highest graduation rate we've ever had. We have pre-K for all our children. We're going to have 3K for all our children. You know, you look across so many issues, the things we're doing here would help people all over this country if they were, you know, the, the approach the federal government was taking includes the Green New Deal. We are putting the Green New Deal into effect here in New York City. And I went to Trump Tower to make the point that his building is polluting and he's going to have to pay fines under our Green New Deal unless he cleans up his buildings. And, and that got his attention, too. This is what you want to do challenge him and make him have to respond and uncover 
uh, the lies, uncover all the things he's doing that are hurting the people of this city and this country. So you can expect a lot more of that. Thanks, everyone. Understand to receive requests from so many other think, the media companies on the community level that we have a special issue coming out and we call you up and we say we can do the following to celebrate an ethnic event. How is that going to be translated from you or to the city agencies back to the agency that creates the ad that has a place that has a uh, insertion? Because the mechanics of what you're suggesting here, of taking a budget and putting 50% aside, is going to be filtered down to so many levels, and I'm afraid there's probably others, that whether it be Miller or another agency, already allocated the money. They're basing it on what fees they're going to get, and if they have to address one ad to 40 different community newspapers from different sizes, there's a major mechanical problem on how to you know, get that done. I'll probably need, thank you. Uh, sorry, lots of things going on. Um, just a, a couple of different pieces. One, obviously, we set the target for the end of FY20 so we could give a chance for ourselves to kind of ramp up and make sure that, one, we've got consistency in the training and an understanding uh, across the different agencies on what the process should be. Part of that is to get um, input from the uh, publications themselves, um, particularly in kind of setting up kind of the uh, list and making sure everyone is on it. Um, but to, to get into a little more detail, I think the biggest thing here is that they do, each of the agencies already do, as you correctly state, make their own decisions about things. They leverage kind of a common uh, contract to get to those. Um, but what we need to do is kind of pull all of those agencies together to have a common conversation, which has not happened. And the focus on this training has been working across these um, several organizations to set up what those standards are. Um, I want to be very clear, probably as the mayor said, we're not going to be perfect out, out of the gate. And part of the process around those trainings to be iterative and to kind of gain knowledge from all of you in terms of how to think about those things. You have to help you. Have you asked every city to submit their budgets to you for FY 2020. So you can look at where they're already, and they've already committed where they're spending that money. So what we're talking about could potentially be 2021. So I'm afraid that to be able to kick this off, what the mayor and what you all want to do, is that if you don't require them to submit those numbers to you now, and look at where they're already spending, because the agencies have already committed, you know, in terms of creatives, yeah. and messaging, that budget, it's wonderful to have this event, and I applaud the mayor and everyone trying to do this. I know Jose's been working on this for quite a while to make it work, but if it's going to work this year, you got to get control of the agencies, not let the agencies get control of you. Yeah, and I... Go ahead. One of the things that happens often, and again, I make the point that we're all here just for a reason, by you know, dint of our own sheer will and, and a lot of you know scotch tape. But part of what will be helpful as well is to have these agencies um, essentially, you know, be public to us. You know, who are the folks that you are going to be training and, and optimally or less than ideally reaching out to and all the rest? Very often, these folks are find it, frankly okay and not necessarily that accessible. And we don't all necessarily turn that lever. So we might be better suited for this particular campaign in a way that they're unaware of. So making that list in the same way that we're going to be publicly accessible to them, to whatever limited degree that is, but making them accessible to us, to, or, or just even apparent, is frankly, I think, far more helpful than what exists now. And, and that so, so I'll, I'll. Okay, last night. Eleanor. Eleanor. The agencies, this is going to be a lot of work for the agencies. And we understand that. But one thing that concerns me is that they may decide that, okay, 
TV and radio are not included in this, so we're going to transfer some of our budget to TV and radio that used to go into print and digital. Are you doing anything to ensure that that does not happen? Okay, let me let me answer um, something. Before. Can I, can I just... oh, hold on, no, no. give me give me just one second. So first, I want to reiterate that you have one person here. This is the only mayor's office in the country that has a community and and, and a director. So you can. Yeah, I'm your person here, so you can bring, we're gonna, how we're gonna record this is we're gonna bring all the feedback to me, and I'm gonna, I'm um, you are gonna bring all the feedback to me, and we are, I'm gonna establish a mechanism to connect with all the agencies, and we are gonna start bringing that. This is very helpful. All the information that you provide today is really, really helpful for us, and we want more information if you have it, so because this is a process that we're gonna work together. I'm a press secretary, I don't think I've met many of you, um, but I want to make sure that each of you leaves with my card, and in addition to your work with Jose, I'm fully accessible, and I can help you break down any barriers that you struggle with. Um, um, okay, one last question, two, two questions, and we are done. We can, work, we, can, we can continue the conversation offline. The is in advertising media placement for over a decade, I've worked for the top agencies in the country, placing multimedia. Uh, multicultural advertising. So my suggestion is most corporations did it then, the census is doing it now. The only way they can ensure ethnic media is included is they use ethnic agencies. So I don't know if you're considering that. There are two ethnic agencies I know for MWBE certified. So it may be something that you consider. That's, that's the information that we're taking, so we're going to look into this. So again, we're going to have a conversation after the event so we can gather all that information. I'm sorry? No, no, no. You talk. I, I'm going to give you my card. Yeah, I'm going to give you my card and we can talk. Okay, last one. This is the last one. Okay. Uh, I mean, I always come to see you guys and hire as well to accommodate all the ethnic media. But one thing, the TV, I think television is very important as well. They are the part of the administrator and the part of the community. They are not aware of that. 24 hours. So the parents serve once a year. My nation is serving 24 hours. Why did you do this? Why did you do this? I'm gonna I'm gonna go get back to you with all the information of why 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 Agni TV is not in the executive order, but we have the reasons for that. Okay, thank you very much, everybody, for being here today.